Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to our Wednesday Night Live. Um, thank you for being here and being a part of our Wednesday night services. Uh, as we begin tonight, we're going to open with, uh, with a word of prayer, uh, sharing just a couple of concerns, uh, then a couple of announcements, and then I just want to kind of walk into the lesson for tonight uh, so that we can engage and and grow together uh, as we grow closer to, to grow closer to one another as we grow closer to Christ. So, uh, as we as we go into our time of prayer, uh, we want to remember the Geis family. Um, as uh, uh, Ginger has been diagnosed with COVID, as well as uh, her teenage son Zach uh, and Miles, uh, her younger son, has also not been feeling great. Uh, but they, they chose not to test him uh, because they already had two people in the house test positive. So we want to be praying for them. Uh, we want to be praying for Bob Marble, um, who, uh, who had a, a fall a couple of weeks ago or last week and uh, had a doctor's appointment yesterday. He's still really stiff and sore, um, but it's, uh, it's a hip that he actually had replaced several years ago. Uh, that he fell and it's just, it's just not feeling good. So we want to keep him in our prayers. Um, uh, just as we look around and, and we want to continue to remember um, uh, the Owenses, Brother Carl and Sister Jean, just, uh, just the ongoing elongated illness. We want to think of Brother Noss and all of our veterans across the street here at the church um, who, who are going into their seventh month of, of lockdown there in the nursing home. Uh, we want to remember them and, and, and all, of our, all of our families that are dealing with that type of, of loss and, and lack of communication and lack of connectivity. Uh, that's been one of the hardest things throughout the COVID is just the inability to connect and to, to be face-to-face -face and engage. And so we want to remember them. Uh, I know that many of you have other requests also, and, and so I just pray that during this time when we are praying that you will, uh, you will feel comfortable to speak those out to God as well. And so uh, let's, let's launch in with a prayer and um, ask God to bless our time together for this evening. Father, as we gather here, we are thankful for the technology and the opportunity to come together. We're also thankful, God, that there are things within our world that are going back to what we feel as normal. Father, we're, we're continuously remembering all of those who are sick and hurting. Father, all of those who are still battling the COVID uh, virus throughout the world. Uh, Father, for all of those businesses and entities and persons who, who may be struggling financially or emotionally or spiritually or psychiatrically through this time of, of the loss of connection and the loss of so many jobs, Father, we just ask that you'll continue to walk with each of them and make yourself known. Father, we, uh, we lift up the Geis family specifically. We, we ask that you will walk with them and keep them safe and protected. Father, we lift up uh, Brother Noss. We lift up uh, Brother Owens and, and Sister Jean, that you will continue to, to bless them where they are and walk with them. Father, and for anything else that I have forgotten or is out there, I just want to pause for a moment so that those who are at home joining me today can lift up names in prayer as well. And so, Father, in this moment, hear our prayers. Father, we are so thankful that your Son was sent here to earth to walk among us, to show us your will and your way, and to help us to understand where our expectations were wrong, where our, our way of life was missing the mark, and in the process to continuously show your grace to us, to show your mercy, your love, your compassion. Father, may we be that beacon of hope and light for someone else around us. May we honor you with our life, May we honor you with our love. May we honor you with our friendships and relationships and our time. God bless this time together tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Oh, um, 
just uh, the biggest announcement that is coming is that uh, a week from today, uh, we were able to get together this week as an elders group and to, to think and plan and pray. And, and here's the thing we know. Right now, we're just going to have to be fluid. Um, there are some things that are going to be different than you've expected. Uh, there's going to be some things that are going to be awkward maybe for you if you haven't, haven't gone through them before. But, but we have to embrace the difference that is right now. And so there are some things like uh, when you get here next week at 6.30, um, you will have the opportunity to come into the sanctuary to, to grab a seat anywhere in the sanctuary or to go into our, our, our prayer room over here beside the stage. Uh, you can do that while you engage or listen to the worship. The worship team will be here in the, in the sanctuary uh, as they are worshiping God in, the, in that space in the moment. Um, when you get here, they will probably already be engaged in song. There's no official welcome and time from 6.30 to 6.45. It is, a, it is an opportunity for you if you, want to, uh, if you want to stand out in the entryway with your mask and visit with people. Um, we invite you to do that. If you want to come in here and spread out and take a seat, if you want to come to the altars, if you want to go into the prayer room, whatever it is, if you want to engage in worship during that time, we invite you to do that. At 6.45, uh, there'll be a bell that will ring, uh, our old Sunday school bell, and you will, you will have that opportunity to go to a few different places at that point in time. In our big classroom, um, on, our, on our west wing of the, of the education wings, uh, there is the end classroom, which the wall had been taken out a couple of years ago between two classrooms to make one large one. Uh, Brother Kenny is going to be down there, and he is going to be uh, leading for the next couple of weeks a Bible study. And so if you'd like to come and be a part of a Bible study, uh, that is an option for you. Um, there is uh, two different groups for our children. We're going to have... Um, uh, the nursery and toddler space will be open upon needs. Um, we, there won't be a person necessarily manning it, but there'll be a person watching. And if you need use of the, uh, of the nursery, uh, they're going to go and help you and take care of the kids during the time of, of, of lesson. Um, there's going to be our younger, our primary group that's going to work from pre-K through second grade. Uh, Miss Renee is going to be leading that group. It's going to be an awesome time. They're going to meet over here in our children. Uh, education wing on this other side of the building, uh, as well as Miss Amy is going to be taking our third through fifth grade kids, uh, and they'll have an opportunity to engage and learn in their own age group. Uh, we also will have our youth group that will meet out in the youth building uh, for a time of, of fun and games and learning. Um, and then uh, we, we've got a, a special group that's going to be meeting at the same time. Sister Dana is going to be leading. Uh, and there's a few people who have, uh, uh, who have agreed to go through this special uh, six-week series with her. Uh, and that's going to be somewhat of a closed group, but that's just our attempt is, is we're, we're, we're trying to diversify and open up so that, uh, so that we don't have too many people crammed into one small space. Uh, we are trying to our very best to be aware uh, uh, of the possibilities, and we want you to be—we want you to feel comfortable and safe when coming. And so, this week, your group may be meeting in a classroom. Next week, it may be meeting in a different location altogether. If the weather is good, we may go outside for a lesson. But we're going to continue to to work to make it the 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 best, safest place that you can be at, and yet come and grow in your walk with Christ, grow in your relationships with others, uh, and that's our goal. And so. We want to invite you to come and be a part of that next week. That means that next week there won't be a video that's going on. Um, uh, Kenny's pretty shy. No, that's not it at all. Uh, as, we, as we move out, uh, different people are going to be involved in different places, and it's just not going to be possible right now for us to be videoing and putting all of that out live for everyone to see. And so, uh, so 
we hope that we're not in need of going back to Wednesday night online, but obviously we're going to continue to watch uh, the world around us, watch the community here that we're in, and to watch the disease, uh, the virus levels, and make sure always that we are working towards keeping people safe and yet still giving them the Word of God and the ability to grow and learn. And so we would invite you to come next week uh, at 6.30. Again, you'll, there'll, there'll be a, you'll have so many options. There will be a sign out in the entryway that will help you know where to go and what to do and how to engage. And so we just invite you to come and, and walk alongside with us. So that's the big announcement. Uh, also, this coming Sunday, uh, a secondary announcement is... We're going to be taking up a special offering. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, we had Hurricane Laura. Right now, we're also praying for those who are dealing with Hurricane uh, Sally, Sandy Sally, the S name, the hurricane that just hit over in Pensacola and Mobile. Uh, we're going to be praying. We're continuing to pray for them. But we have five congregations of the Church of God that are located in and around Lake Charles. And so uh, we have been able to connect with the pastors and the churches. Uh, there is some damage on some of those. Um, I'm going to try to include a picture right here to show you one of our churches that had some pretty significant damage, as well as the parsonage of that church being significantly damaged. Uh, and we're going to be taking up a special offering here this coming Sunday that is going to go to help those churches there in South Louisiana in the Lake Charles area. And so we would just invite you to come uh, to be a part of that offering this coming Sunday. If you can't be here personally, you can give online through our website. You can, um, you can go through your online banking for your personal bank account, and you can have it delivered to the church. Uh, just make sure in the memo that you put uh, Hurricane Laura or put a uh, special offering or missions, something like that, that would don denote to us that it's intended for this special offering uh, for the victims of Hurricane Laura. So that's, uh, that's coming up this coming Sunday as well. So as we move into the lesson, um, I want to start with, with kind of acknowledging we've been on this journey for the last uh, three or four months now where we have been talking about when, how, and where to worship. And, and so uh, we've been on this journey, and so we've, we've worshiped in silence, we have worshiped in song, we have worshiped in prayer, we have worshiped in nature, we have worshiped with our family, uh, we have worshiped in hurt and in, in so many different ways. As we continue to walk through that, uh, today, as I was preparing for what to bring to you, uh, I started this morning in a, a, a Zoom meeting. In this Zoom meeting were myself and eight other uh, church leaders um, from around the North American area. Uh, we had some from Canada, we had some from uh, Arizona, some from uh, Pennsylvania and Florida and Illinois and here in Louisiana, and just kind of spread out all over the United States and Canada. And what we found as we, as we shared together and we, we, we took time to pray for one another, we are finding that wherever you're at right now, the world is engaged in conflict. And so the question that arose in my heart and my soul uh, to talk about tonight was, how do we worship in the conflict? Uh, we often think of conflict as a completely horrible, negative thing that should never happen in the church. But the reality is, is conflict is always there. Um, John Ortberg, a, a pastor uh, that's out in California who used to be at Willow Creek Association, which was the largest church association in the United States for about three decades. Uh, he was their teaching pastor. And I remember one time uh, him saying in a lesson that uh, being a pastor, being a leader in a church, is about learning how to disappoint people at a pace that they can withstand. And what he meant by that, when he went back and explained it, was that a pastor's job is to honestly share with people in their congregation uh, where they're wrong and how they can change. And so that is conflict. 
That is 100% conflict and it's intentionally being in it. And the reality is, is Jesus was always engaged in conflict. Everywhere he went, he was being conflicted with uh, the, the, the beliefs and history that people had. He was conflicted with the Roman government. He was conflicted with, with the will and the way of the Jewish leaders. He was in conflict with how people perceived holiness and how they perceived God and how they perceived the ability to get into heaven. And, and the truth of the matter is, is I think so often that the church today, if we were truly honest with ourselves, would have to be really concerned that if Jesus came back today, we would not respond as the Pharisees did then. Because as the church, we have... We have placed in our, in our worship styles, we have placed so much importance on preference. We have placed so much importance on the way that we have done things, um, tradition. But in the process, we have, we have forgotten some of the, the influence that should be coming in from the Bible, the influence that should be coming in from the Holy Spirit and the influences that should be coming in from just life experiences. We tend to focus very heavily on tradition. When I was thinking about this, and, and we were talking about this today, uh, the passage that came to me was actually um, almost the entire chapter of John 10. Now that's really long and would be very boring for me to read to you in whole. But the... The, the, the chapter, John chapter 10, begins with the parable of the good shepherd. Um, and this parable is, um, is this way. Truly I tell you, I am, the, I am the door of the sheep. All who came before me are thieves and robbers, but the sheep do not hear them. I am the door. If anyone enters through me, he may be saved and shall go in and out and find pasture. The thieves come only to steal and kill and destroy. I came that they might have life and they might have it abundantly. So this, this parable of the sheep is about Jesus being the one who keeps the true way to God. Um, the, the Pharisees of the day, the religious leaders of the day, had, go, had moved to this place where uh, every, every rabbi, every leader had a yoke. Um, and this, the yoke was the list of things that they believed one must accomplish in order to earn their way into heaven. They had forgotten that throughout time, uh, God had never once equated action and earning with heaven. He was more concerned with what people were willing to sacrifice to keep him first in their lives. He was more concerned with what people were willing to sacrifice to take care of the less fortunate. God in the Old Testament was far more concerned with people making sure that they believed that God was on top and not they themselves. And I think we struggle with that today as well. You know, we often, we often spend our time when we, when we begin to think about our own salvation with comparing ourselves to other people. And there's a problem with that. The problem when we compare ourselves to other people is we can always find people that are worse off than us. We can always find people who are doing way worse in their Christian walk than we are. But we can also find people who are doing it way better, at least in one aspect. And we consider ourselves to be failures and losses and hopeless. You know, in my life, I was, I was influenced. Uh, many people here in our congregation know the, the Ninemeyer family. They were, they were at the church in Oak Grove where I was at as a kid uh, for, uh, I have no idea, they must have been there 20 years. Uh, Brother Paul and Sister Gussie. And they were phenomenal 
amazing ministers and, and their, their ministry outreach spreads across the globe. Uh, it was amazing when I moved up to Anderson, Indiana where, to go to seminary. I was there at the national headquarters of the Church of God. And if I met anyone who attended Anderson University or Anderson College at the time uh, in the 80s or 90s, and they found out I was from Oak Grove, they would always ask, oh, do you know the Nine Myers? Uh, because they left this legacy. And Brother Paul, still at 90 years old, is still teaching and preaching and, and leading people in, in Christian leadership on staff at a church here in the state still. But where I wanted to go with this is an understanding. Um, Sister Gussie, uh, Brother Paul's wife, Sister Gussie was a prayer warrior before she passed away. And she had in her den a prayer chair. And it was a chair that she would take and put her elbows and her head in and put her knees on the carpet. And she would pray for hours and hours at a time. I remember when I got my call to ministry thinking that, that I should look like that. Well, I don't look like that. She had holes in her carpet where her knees were because of the years and years and years of being in the same place doing that very thing. But I also, when looking around, realized that there were things that God had empowered and encouraged and, and had in, embedded in me that I did differently from her and, and maybe some people would say better. You see, we can't compare ourselves to other people because when we do that, we're either going to tower over them or we're going to fall way short of them. But God did not make us all the same. What we have to do is enter into it looking towards God. What does God have for you? And that was what the religious leaders had forgotten in that day. Jesus comes on the scene and he begins to do all of these miraculous works. He begins to show the people that God wants to deliver them from their, from, from, from their diseases, whatever those diseases may be. Whether it was poverty, whether it was, whether it was um, uh, an actual virus or illness or disease or death, or whether it was... Uh, bigotry or selfishness or whatever the disease that was conquering their soul was, Jesus wanted to deliver them from that. In the second half of the, the, the tenth chapter of John, we see a place where the people around Jesus just get a little bit fed up. And, and I think this is where God had me working today in thinking through conflict. In chapter 10, verse 23, it says, It was winter, and Jesus was walking to the temple in the portico of Solomon. The Jews uh, therefore gathered around him and were saying to him, How long will you keep us in suspense? If you are the Christ, tell us plainly. If you were the Messiah, just say so. And I love Jesus' response because he's in the midst of a conflict. He says, I told you and you did not believe me. The works that I do in my Father's name, these bear witness of me. But you do not believe because you are not my sheep. My sheep hear my voice and I know them and they follow me. And I give eternal life to them and they shall never perish and no one shall snatch them out of my hand. My Father who has given them to me is greater than all and no one is able to snatch them out of my Father's hand. Now this passage is oft often quoted and used in various other contexts of Scripture. But for me, when I read this, especially in light of this conversation about conflict and worshiping Him in the conflict, is all so often we look for God to respond the same way today that He did 10 years ago, 15 years ago. We 
want God to look the way that he's always looked. Without, throughout Scripture, more than one place, Jesus makes a statement, the Bible makes a statement on his behalf, that God does not work the same way twice. You can't become dependent on the, on the view of what it's going to look like for him to show up. For, for some people, Jesus showed up before they died, and he stopped that from happening. For other people, he showed up after they had gone, and he used that as a way to talk about the way that he brings new life into us. For he himself, he died, was in the ground for three days, and then walked out under his own power. You know, if he had chose to do all of those things the same way, we never would have seen Jesus for who he was, and we never would have seen God for how he loves us. And I think so often the church of America today wants God to show up and look like he did on September 11th. They want God to show up and look like he did in the 40s and 50s. They want God to show up and look like he did when they very first met him at the altar. But the reality is, is the world has changed and you have changed from each of those scenarios. And if God showed up the way he did then, he wouldn't be the God that you need today. He would not be responding to the way that you needed him today. But for some reason, when we miss him, when we miss what he's done because we're looking for him to work the same way he did, we assume that means he didn't come at all. And that's not the God that I serve. I love the Church of God hymnal. This book is full of writings, um, not just songs, but poems as well. And I was looking the other day and I came across this one poem and this was written in 1955. And the title of it is, God of All Whose Love Surrounds Us. It says, God of all whose love surround us, surrounds us, we unite in praise of thee, one in heart and one in purpose, one in Christian love to be. Lord, awake us to the version, to the vision of a world redeemed and free, of a world redeemed and free. Thou hast led us by thy spirit to accept thy kingdom's goal. Hand in hand with joy advancing, we are one in heart and soul. Filled by thee with one great passion, that the world may be made whole. That the world may be made whole. Grant us in the minds maturing thine own guidance on our way. Purge our hearts from hate and envy. Quench the pride that may hold a sway. Quicken us with power abundant for the work we face today, for the work we face today. Let us then our service render, witnessing thy love for all, toiling with unceasing fervor, swift to venture at thy call. Make us in thy strength victorious with our Christ, the Lord of all, with our Christ, the Lord of all. I read this and I thought about the way that God works in our lives today. God is not happy with the division of the world. But that's why he put the church here. It is in that conflict that we find him. I've met a lot of people in my life some people with great character and some people with not so great character. There is a common factor that I have found, though. People of great character have often been through great turbulation, tribulation. 
people of great character have had conflict in their lives, and they have figured out how to deal with it. The church, so often we just shut down and we go, we're not supposed to have conflict. I believe the church is the place where conflict lives. We're sitting on a ground that, it's, that has been owned by Satan for millennia. And 25 years ago, the elders and the pastors and the congregants of this congregation decided to take and put a church here on top of it. Satan wants to own this piece of land. And the church has claimed it for themselves and for God. Well, that in and of itself is conflict that is going to go unceasing. Satan wants what he can't have. And Christ has it. So the church is going to be tested. The people are going to be tested. Satan wants your heart, your soul. And so he's going to test and tempt you. I have found so often the people who are tempted and tested the least are that way because they're not putting up a fight. If you're going to stand firm with Christ, you're going to face struggles. You're, you're going to be engaged in conflict. Remember who you're fighting for. Remember who you're fighting alongside of. Remember, remember who your fight is with. We've come into a place in this world where the church has forgotten the words of Paul in Philippians. Philippians Philippians 2 If there is there if if therefore there is any encouragement in Christ if there is any Cons consolation of love, if there is any fellowship with the Spirit, if there is any affection and compassion, make my joy complete by being of the same mind, maintaining the same love, and united in the same Spirit, intent on one purpose. Do nothing from selfishness or empty conceit but with humility of mind, let each of you regard one another as more important than himself. The world is in conflict because it has been taught that one person's viewpoint is the right viewpoint. You know what? I don't have to agree with you to love you. You don't have to agree with me to love me. And no one deserves to be belittled when they may not even have enough information to take to make any kind of informed choice. Me included. We must learn to love people the way Christ loved them. How is that, you ask? Christ met people at their point of conflict. A man named Levi, who was a tax collector, shunned by society, shunned by the Jews, shunned by the religious elite. And Jesus says, can I come eat with you? Can I meet your friends? The people who are okay with who you are, can I meet them? Can I love on them? Can I recline with them? Now, 
Jesus did not go there and approve of everything they did. He went there and he called the very best out of them. He called Levi to become Matthew. You know, the guy that wrote the first book of the New Testament. He called him to become someone who gave up and loved other people and to repay retributions of any wrongs that he had given anyone. He called Levi to walk away from the lifestyle that he had and to join him in ministry. And he gave that call to every one of Levi's friends. Not to become disciples, but to walk with him. To leave behind the, the, the scheming, greedy ways that, were, that, that the tax collectors were so known for. When he, when he met a woman who was caught in adultery, he didn't stone her to death as the law called for. Instead, what he did was challenged her to go and sin no more. When he came upon a rich young ruler who was certain that he had done everything right in life, Jesus looked at him and says, but you're still holding on to the stuff of this world. Your greed is there. If you go and sell that, well, Jesus knew he wouldn't. When Jesus meets people, he meets them where they are and he doesn't judge them for how they became who they are. What he does is he loves on them and he challenges them to get better. He engages them in dialogue. We often try to engage in discussion. Uh, my, uh, my seminary professor for uh, church history was Dr. Walter Froese. And Dr. Froese was a first generation American from Germany. And uh, his, his, his idea, his thought process led him to say, you should never have a discussion with anyone because the word discussion comes from the same word, root word as percussion, which is to beat something. He said, so a discussion is about me trying to beat my ideas into your head. What we need is dialogue, open dialogue, where I can hear you and you can hear me. And through that, we can grow in love and compassion. And through that, we can also openly challenge one another to become better. The church has lost that. The world has given it away with no desire for it. So I challenge you to worship in the conflict of this world. Doesn't matter which side of the which side of the the the, the aisle you sit on. If you are Democrat or Republican, just because you believe one way, I hope you have done enough history and thought and looking into it to believe that way and to vote that way. But you also can't hate a person just because they're on the other side of that aisle. I believe you can be pro-police and pro-black people. I believe we can have social justice without social anarchy. I believe that we can reform things that are broken without tearing down the people within that that aren't. You see, we have to learn how to be in conflict and not allow that to affect our soul. Soul conflict is very different that's where we get words like, I hate. And we follow that up with a name. That's not Christian. That's not God. So here's my challenge for you. Be a person of conflict, but not discord. Be a person of dialogue and not discussion. Be a person who values others even when we don't agree with them. Be a person who loves the Lord and looks for the Lord. 
Be a person who's not stuck on doing something the way that we've always done it because it's the way we always did it. But be a person who looks for how God is going to respond anew this time. How is God going to show up in your life this week? It probably won't be the same way he showed up last week. So look for him. Keep your eyes open. Engage in a daily devotional that's going to build you and his relationships together. Walk with Christ and invite him to show you his will and his way. Let us pray. Father, we may we continue to look more like you every day. May we be people who are ever looking forward to who you call us to be. May we not lose our history because it is so informative and it is so helpful in helping to guide us move forward. And if we lose our heritage, we have lost a great connection to the shoulders that we are standing on, the shoulders of giants. But Father, may we not become nostalgic and want to go back to those places. May we look for the way that you want to work today. May we look for the way that you want to move in our hearts today. Not looking for you to show up in the, in the, in the discord that we're having between, between us and a coworker today. But Father, trusting that you're going to be moving and it might, may not look the same as it did 20 years ago or the last person we had a disagreement with. God, may we continue to be people who show you to the world around us. Father, be with our congregation as we find ways to open up and to connect face to face. May we do so healthily and may we do so in greatest protection of people. Father, may we continue to see you at work around us and may we continue to carry you to the world that is around you. Give us strength to fight in this battle. Give us wisdom to know when to raise our hands and when to lower them. And give us the words to speak when people need your encouragement. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Thank you guys for being here tonight. I hope you have a great rest of the week. I look forward to seeing you Sunday when we're going to be taking up that special offering. And I also look forward to seeing you next Wednesday in person if you're ready to do that. Um, thank you so much for all that you do. Uh, there are still a few surveys that I would like for people to engage in. Uh, and so I'll be sending, uh, there'll be a link on the screen that you can engage that way. Um, and I'll also be sending out an email with those as well because we want to help you find your place in ministry. Have a great week and God bless you and may he walk with you and show you his will and his way. Thank you. Goodbye. <laughs>